Wait, what is up? What is up? Come on in. It is Saturday night check-in. I am live on YouTube and on Facebook. I'm getting ready to go live on IG. Hope all is well. Hope all is well. I need to grab a drink. Sorry about that. The water, when you open it, it was all the way to the top. So I didn't want to fully drink it on camera. Let's get back to, you know, I don't want to filter. Just want to look like me. I don't know why it's looking like this, though. Maybe I need to change it. Come on in. I don't know how many of you coming in. I know people normally come in faster on YouTube. And let me move. I mean, on IG. Yeah. Let me move my phone to this side. Hey, Ebony. No, that's story. That's this card. That can go live. Hey, Ebony is the first person I see on YouTube. I am now live on IG. Let's see how long it takes them to come on in on IG. I meant to send a text message that I was going live, and I did not. So we will see who all comes on tonight. Smarty Pants is first one on, on YouTube and on IG. Anthony is the second. Shania is the third. Nicole, sincerely Chelsea. Hey, Amanda on YouTube. Short Spice. Tisha Holman. Hey, Tisha. Love and miss you. Hey, Delita. Love and miss you. Latrivia. Kevin Billings, Inspire One. There's one of the names that won't let me really even see who it is. Uh, hey, Tanya. Reva, Chelsea, Inspire One. Simone, come on in, come on in. What is going on tonight? This is a Saturday night. For those who don't know, we are wrapping up a conference here in Dallas. Uh, ILS, that is what I have been doing this week. I thought I was going to go live a couple of days before the conference. Did not happen. I have been, I feel like, all over the world. Hey, Brother Jose. Hey, Tasha. Yes, Brother Kevin, it was good. It was good. And um, But I've had a busy week. On Monday, I went to East Texas, to Nacogdoches, to check on my aunt. Spent the night there with her. Came on back. and. Wednesday went to um, partners gathering fellowship and Thursday and Friday I was at the conference had some good lunch with some good people today I was at the conference but left early um, to go to Corsicana Texas which is actually my hometown to support one of my childhood friends who's daughter passed away. So when you are praying, and I'm going to just say uh, the last names, and that will be sufficient. When you are lifting up names, lift up uh, my friend, the Rooks family and the Jesse family. Her father is the Jesse family. That's the last name, not his first name. And the mother's name, last name is Rooks. And so just lift them up in prayer. It's a Difficult thing to bury a child. It is out of order. Um, it is not supposed to happen in the way that our minds think. Even though we are devastated when our parents leave this earth, uh, especially when they leave prematurely. Uh, hey, Super Styler. Um, that is. Um, but to lose a child, and I know you know Tanya T. Williams. I know you know personally, and so lift them up. Um, she, her mother is grieving, her father is grieving, but she also left two small children. And so, um, children who are small, um, fourth grade and maybe seventh grade. So not that small, but young. And so, Hey, Shawnee, um, just, just, um, again, keep them in your prayers. And I'm going to just start like this tonight because you all know, because of the grief I have experienced in my life, grief is near and dear to my heart when people are grieving. Um, there was a young man in Tennessee 
Hey, Jill, I can't believe I didn't get to see you. Are you still in Dallas? Will you be at church tomorrow? Um, yes, Brother Kevin, finish strong. I'll get to that, those in a second. Um, the young man in Tennessee, I don't know if you heard in the headlines, I believe it was about two weeks ago, he was, I guess they say, kicked out of a bar. Um, his friends left. They got in one vehicle. I may have gotten some of the details wrong, uh, but anyway, he ended up leaving by himself, though he was with people when he was there. And so, hey, Taylor, he was intoxicated and unfortunately went mi missing. And even more unfortunately, they found his body uh, yesterday. And so I lift up uh, their family, been praying for the mother and the father and the stepfather of Riley Strain, um, you send your children off to college for life to get better for them, for them to grow up, you know, develop into the young person that develop their talents, their skills and acquire knowledge. And you don't send them off to college for them to have a spring break excursion and not return home. And so I am praying for all of those who are grieving, who are mourning, the loss of loved ones. And so that's how my day went today. Um, and even though it was a heavy moment, I actually was happy to see a lot of loved ones. And when I say loved ones, I don't even mean people related to me. But the older you get, the people from your hometown, especially when you're from a young, a small town, they become like family. And so I saw so many people today that uh, I have not seen in a very, very long time because I don't go home often because, you know, I don't have family there anymore. But what's interesting is there was an older gentleman there that told me, hey, girl, hey, Tanil. He was like, you did a good job today. I had given words. And um, he said, I haven't seen you since I was a baby. You were a baby. And I was like, sir, I haven't been a baby in a very long time. So you you didn't see me all my life. You didn't, you didn't see me when I was... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seven, eight, to nineteen. I don't know, but he said a baby, so that was funny to me. Hey, Shalise, that was that was interesting to me that he said that. But uh, yeah, he said a baby, Shania. Like, now we said a little girl. If you say since high school, she said a little girl, and I was like, oh, okay, that's that's a long time. I don't want to tell you how many years today that is, but that's a long time if you haven't seen me since I was a little girl. But anyway. So today was a full day. And, you know, even in somber occasions or in loss, um, hopefully there's always a space for love. You know, grief and love, I like to say it this way. This is the way the Holy Spirit gave it to me this past summer when I had to speak. Um, and one of my classmates, friend, uh, Pat, he passed. And, um, you know, people often say grief is the price you pay for love. But the Lord really told me as I was preparing to have words for his uh, service. Yes, the 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, you know, okay. Uh, you didn't see me from a high school graduation. Did you give me a gift from a high school graduation? I don't know. Anyway, um, that grief and love are actually the opposite side of the same coin. There cannot be grief or a profound loss if there has never been love. And so even though we don't want to grieve and we, you know, it's hurtful to grieve, you, you only really grieve when there's been something worth losing. Sometimes um, things you lose, you want to lose. But there are other times that grief and love occupy the same space. And so that's what I, I, I attribute today to. We went to mourn and I, I told my friend, I said, we came to mourn with you. The Bible says rejoice with them that rejoice, weep them with them that weep. We came to weep with you. 
And I know, I know, and I don't know who needs to hear this. I don't know. Somebody may need to hear this on the replay. Somebody may need to come back and listen to this in a month or in a year, whenever you encounter grief and you don't know what, what to do. The Lord just began to speak. I wanted to write out something perfect, but I didn't write. The Holy Spirit said, just flow. And I didn't have any idea what I was going to say when I stood up other than Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that is weak. And that's a hard thing, Smarty Pants. I know you know. But the Lord said, I said to them, I know we're at church and I know they've already told you to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And we've given you all the scriptures that tell you where your loved one is, tell you where your daughter is, tell you where your son is, tell you where your spouse is, tell you where your mother is. We give you all the scriptures to let you know and give you comfort in knowing that you will see them again. But I didn't come here today to talk to you about where your daughter is. I came to talk to you about where you are. Right now, you're in a season of grief. Don't rush through it. Don't try to avoid it. Don't try to jump over it. All you have to do is just sit in it for a moment. Don't be strong because his strength is made perfect in your weakness. So my challenge to her and to, to, uh, to her daughter's father was to be weak. And it may be needs to be your challenge too, because this doesn't just apply to grief. We all come to the table bringing our strength, our skills, our intellect, our abilities, our talents. We come bringing everything that we are to the table, whatever the table is requiring of you, whatever the table is, the table of marriage, the table of raising children, the table of doing ministry, the table of building a business, whatever it is that is before you, we bring all of us to the table as if all of us is enough. And God is saying, mm -mm, all those are your strengths you brought to the table. Where's that weakness? That's what I'm looking for because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I'm looking for the spot for my spirit to land on. See, you're standing there believing how smart you are and you're standing there believing how much you've thought this plan out and you've got all of this together. And God is saying, I'm looking for my place. Wait a minute, there it is, it's in weakness. Hey, Kadisha, it is in weakness. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I said this a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was two weeks ago when we came back from San Antonio and I had an opportunity to stop by and to pour into some ministers and elders. And I said, God is waiting for you to exchange your strength for his weakness. You've assessed all of your strengths. You know, you have your list of things that you're good at, things you think you're great at, things that are in your wheelhouse, all of these ways that we define what we bring and who we are and what we do. But when is the last time you've assessed your weaknesses? Because that's the place that makes you a candidate to receive God's strength. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. There's an exchange, Shawnee. Listen, there's always exchange. That's why he gives you beauty for ashes. You can't hold the beauty and the ashes at the same time. He says, I'll give you beauty for ashes. So when you release the ashes, then you're able to receive the beauty. Uh, he's going to give you the oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness. So he does not intend for these two things to coexist. He extends for you to release the spirit of heaviness and now receive joy. He, it's an exchange. It is an exchange and God is waiting for you to release what's in your hand to receive what's in his. Oh, that's good. God is waiting for you to release what is in your hand and receive what's in his. I'll delete the, I'm so sorry. She is on YouTube said I'm struggling with grieving loss of my father in August and my husband in November. That's a lot, Dolita. I don't want you to try to navigate that season by yourself. I'm praying for you. I, I really want to tell you to, um, hopefully you have family you can talk to, 
Hopefully you can find a good Christian therapist to talk to. Hopefully you have someone that can wrap their arms around you. But I want you to understand, do not put undue pressure on yourself. Do not try to force yourself to be stronger or to be strong. Do not try to force yourself to, to um, just move on as if you have not encountered these losses. I really want you, listen, this is what I said today. The strength is made perfect in the weakness. Yes. But uh, what I want you to know is that we have a high priest who can be touched by the feelings of your infirmities. And if you want the high priest, who is Jesus, to touch or to feel what you are feeling, you've got to feel it. The enemy fights us on feeling the pain because we believe if we avoid the pain, then we never have to feel it. But there is no way to avoid the pain of grief. It will rear its head one way or the other. So when you feel like you want to cry, just cry. When you have a good memory and you want to laugh about it, you have the freedom to do so. I do not want you to incarcerate yourself to grieving like anyone else or following the steps of grief and all of these things that man has said. Listen, sit there and cry. If you need to cry for an hour, cry. All I ask that you do is while you're crying, invite God into that moment. Lord, I miss my husband. Lord, I miss my father. Lord, I am hurting. Lord, I, this, is, this is overwhelming. Lord, your word says, cast my cares on you. I can cast it. Lord, I'm trying to throw it on you, but I need help. I need your grace. I can't do it. I can't release it. The pain is unbearable. Whatever it is you are feeling, Dolita, you have permission, not from me. I don't want you to think I'm giving you permission. I want you to give yourself permission to feel it so that you can go through it. It is important to go through grief, to realize that grief is a marathon, not a sprint. And to also realize there, there's a saying that says, never build a house where God intended you to pitch a tent. Meaning, do not make a permanent um, marker, meaning this is where you're going to reside in grief for the rest of your life when God intended for you to allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you through it. Hey, Untrain. Hey, Ashley. I'm praying for you, Dolita. I definitely will add your name to the prayer list and I am praying for you. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Now, I knew the first part of this was going to be a little heavy. And if it was for nobody but Delitha to be able to say, I'm struggling with grieving, then I shared that for that reason. Um, I know that nothing is wasted. Yes, nothing is wasted. And so if it was only for you, you are enough. And God wanted you to hear it. And God wanted you to know that you are not alone. Hallelujah. Hey, Lawrence. Yes, it was good to see you at the, at the conference too. Hey, April, come on in. I want to talk about something briefly. I, I say briefly, and I, I saw my brother, Pastor Ben Butler, came on. I know I said briefly a lot, probably, but I really want to talk about something briefly because I haven't fully unpacked it. And so generally, if I haven't unpacked it, I really don't like to talk about it until I unpack it. But I want to I want to talk about um, a word. Um, um, let me do it this way. I know I'm going to pull up a definition. It's a definition that, you know. But I still want to go ahead and give it to you. And the word is you're going to think, what is this word? Elder Dobbins is getting ready to talk about the word is daily. D A. I-L-Y. It's an adjective or an adverb that refers to something happening, done, produced, or occurring every day or every weekday. It emphasizes 
the regularity and the routine nature of an action of an, or occurrence. Oh, I like that. It emphasizes the regularity and routine nature of an action or occurrence. I want to start now by asking you, what do you do daily? What one thing, what one habit do you have that you do daily? I'm going to give you just some basic things. You could say, I take a shower daily or, or bath. I hope you do. Hey, walk away, Renee. Or you could say, uh, I eat daily. Or you could say, I, I read books a day, daily. What habits, now let's be more specific, spiritual habits do you do daily? So as an adjective, it can describe things that are part of an everyday routine, such as daily tasks or daily bread. As an adverb, it might be used to describe the frequency of an action. For example, this service runs daily. Hey, Monique, so someone could say, we're providing you this service. How often do you provide it? We provide it daily. Or someone can use it as an adjective to describe a routine, a daily task, such as daily bread. So when I talk about daily, when I think of daily, it is um, something that I think of in my spiritual walk in relationship to my disciplines. Thank Kadisha said, I pray daily. Yes, Smarty Pants says, I praise the Lord daily. What do you do daily? Remember, Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. When you pray, are you asking God for daily bread? You know, this daily bread is reminiscent of the Old Testament when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and God would allow manna to come down from heaven. And he told them that they would have to eat what was provided that day. They could not save it for the next day because it was spoiled. So that was the Old Testament. And I'm going to give you the scriptures. But then in the New Testament, Jesus says it this way, give us this day our daily bread. Well, we know the bread that Jesus is talking about is not, um, is not uh, natural bread. The bread he is speaking about is spiritual bread. Opulent says, I get up and pray from six to seven, Monday through Friday with Elder Dobbins on every Wednesday. So she has a routine of praying daily. So what do you do daily? Now, the next question is, what is God asking you to do that you are not currently doing daily? To be a, a good disciple, a good follower of Jesus, what things do you think we should do daily? So I'm getting ready to just give you a lot of scriptures and I'm getting ready to see wherever this flows. Book of Exodus chapter 16, verse four, refers to what I was talking about with the manna from heaven. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Somebody put it in the comments every day. That I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So he tells them, go out. I'm going to rain down bread. Hey, Diana. Hey, Faith Perez. And I'm going to give you bread every day. Numbers 28 and 3 says, And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord, two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day. So they are to offer up a sacrifice. This is in the book of Numbers. Day by day. This was something that was required of the children of Israel in the Old Testament to offer up an offering of a lamb of the first year, two lambs of the first year. And they were supposed to offer up these sacrifices every day. First Chronicles 16 and 37 says, so he left there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Asaph and his brethren to minister before the Ark continually as every day's work required. So this is talking about the work that was required for the Ark of the Covenant 
that was required daily. As you remember in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is where the presence of the Lord dwelt. It symbolized the presence of the Lord. There was an outer court or inner court and a holy of holies. The only, the priest could go into the holy of holies. And there was a work that was done before the Ark every day, every day. I'm trying to see which scripture I'm going to next. Matthew 6 and 11, this is Jesus praying, give us this day our daily bread. So just as Jesus gave them daily bread in the wilderness, which was manna for them to eat, hey, lady, HMC, HMC, he is now, Jesus is asking and modeling before the disciples that this is how you should pray. You should ask him for daily bread. Hey, Maurice, hey, Karen, Luke 9 and 23 says, and he said unto them all, Somebody put in the comments and say all. Oh, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So Jesus says that all of us, that's why I wanted you to put all in the comments, are to take up our cross which is symbolic of what he did when he went to the cross, which means we have to crucify our flesh. His crucifixion is different from ours. Our crucifixion is to our will, to our way, to our desires, we, to the things that are not pleasing in his sight, to the things that he has told us that he does not uh, desire those who follow him to do. We are to take up our cross and follow him daily. Acts 17 and 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalo Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Listen, daily, that's the word, Jolly, daily. I'm going to give you this scripture here in the New Living Translation. This is the importance. This is what each one of you, uh, you and me, what we should do daily. Let me see. Let me give you, I want this scripture in another translation. Okay. One second. I want this scripture in the New Living Translation. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. So the Bereans were open to Paul and they were eager to listen, but they were also diligent in searching the scriptures daily to verify the accuracy of what they were teaching. Let me ask you, how many times have you heard a, 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 script, a sermon preached? Or a, listen, a reel on IG, you go to TikTok and you hear somebody even giving a prophetic word. Do you go to the scriptures and search them daily to verify and test the authenticity and the accuracy of that which you heard? We should, we should search the scriptures daily. Hey, prophetess. Hey, Patrice James. Hey, Felicia. That's Acts 17 and 11. For those of you who are coming on, I am talking about a word that is critical when it is or imperative to the life of a believer. Those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the word daily. In a word where we don't want to use the word routine or we don't want a word to use religious because religion uh, denotes a routine, but it's nothing wrong with the routine that is drawing you closer to God. I want you to understand that it is the trick of the enemy to make a play on words and make you believe that there should not be things that you do every day, that you don't have to do this every day. You're just being religious. Don't just be legalistic because he understands that you will grow in maturity, that you will grow in grace, 2 Peter 3 and 18, you will grow in the knowledge of God. You will grow. You will begin to produce the fruit of the spirit when you do certain things daily.
So Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. The Old Testament in the book of Numbers said they were to offer up sacrifices daily. Now, Hebrews 3 and 13 says something. Oh, this is interesting. When we think about daily, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be heartened through the deceitfulness of sin. Let's pull that one up in the New Living Translation. Hey, Dr. Cecilia. Hey, Tyra, Rochelle, Array. It says, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. This really tells us about the importance of daily encouragement and warning believers to remain vigilant against sin. The concept of today means that it is urgent. So you need to do it today. It is urgent so that you can help to prevent someone's from being hardened, heart from being hardened to that sin, meaning they will become desensitized to it. And so because no one is calling them uh, into accountability or no one is warning them about the sin that they are participating in, they do it today, then they do it tomorrow, and then no one is warning, then now you are will have a harden of the heart in this area. But we need to encourage one another daily. Hey, Urban Rose, that's so true, Brother Lawrence. So again, Luke 8, 11 and 3 uh, really reiterates what Jesus said, or it is a replica of what Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 11. Give us day by day our daily bread. Psalm 68 and 19. This is a good one. Because now this is not something that you do daily. This is something that God does daily. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Let's, 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 let's do this one in the New Living Translation because there are not only things that God is requiring of us to do daily or things that are beneficial for us to do daily. This says uh, that he is daily loading us up with his benefits. That is Psalms 68 and 19. Proverbs 8 and 34 says, blessed is the man that heareth me. I want you to hear this. Watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. So now this is a blessing that you will receive. Um, blessed is the man that heareth me. So first you heard him watching for me daily at my gates, waiting for me outside my home. It's an approach of being eager and waiting for God. There's an anticipation and an attentiveness to his voice and waiting at his gates that will cause you to be Bless. Hey, Janita. I'm going to read you a few more. Acts 2, 46 through 47. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. That was Psalms 68 and 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loaded us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Let, let, let's hold on. Let me give you another scripture while we're reading that. I'm going to give you another scripture in one section. I want to make sure I know where it is. Psalms 103 and 2 says, I, don't, I want it in the King James first, and I'll come back to that one. Psalms 102 and th 103 and 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Listen, all this stuff that's going on in the world, I do not want you to forget that, yes, Jesus paid the price for our salvation, but there are also other benefits to following Jesus. 
I hope I answered your question again with that scripture. That was Psalm 68 and 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Listen, technology is helping me. Hold on one right quick. I just need to stop because that benefit stuck out to me. And maybe some of you didn't know. So let me, okay, I'm going to read this again. Psalm 103 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Psalms 116 and 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalm 68 and 19. I already read it. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits even the God of our salvation. So, so this is not just talking about the salvation. This is daily loading us with benefits. First Timothy 6 and 2 says, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. Te these things teach and exhort. Let me give you that scripture in another translation. This is 1 Timothy 6 and 2. Hey, Raya. Says if you are a slave, we have to understand the context and times. It's not like the slavery that was here that we, you know, you know, believe we need some restitution for. But if you are a slave, Respect your masters and work hard for them. If you are, if you have a job, respect them and do what is required of you, not just when they are watching. And if your master is a believer, there is no excuse for being disrespectful. You should work all the harder because you are helping another believer by your at, at your efforts. Teach these truths, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. What the scripture is really saying that when I am working for a believer or working with a believer, or even if I'm on a job where they are not believers, there should be a benefit to them for me being there. Because I'm a believer, because I'm a following Jesus, because I'm a disciple, because I have disciplines, there should be a benefit to them for me being on that job, in that position, in that marriage, in that ministry. I come with benefits because I have been a recipient of benefits. I hope you caught that. I come, I'm a benefit. When I come, it, it is beneficial. So when I show up, I am beneficial because I have first been a recipient of his benefits. A few more scriptures. Acts 2, 46 through 47. Now I could just preach these two scriptures. Uh, because these scriptures have really been speaking to me about the last year or so God has been speaking to me. And every time I talk about agreement, this is one of the scriptures that I use. But it says, and they, referring to the church, the disciples and the church, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They continue daily in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So they were with one accord. They had singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, somebody say it, daily, such as should be saved. I want you to listen to that. The Lord added to the church daily. The Lord has not yet stopped adding to the church daily. Somebody is receiving salvation daily. If you are not witnessing somebody receiving God daily, that means you may want to be a witness of Jesus so that you can now be an eyewitness to somebody receiving him daily. I hope that made sense. Meaning if you're not seeing anybody coming to Jesus daily, it would also mean you're probably not evangelizing. You're probably not offering the gospel. You're probably not stepping out on faith to, to offer a solution to this world but he is still adding to the uh, church daily. Let me read this scripture to you in the New Living Translation. It says, they worship together at the temple each day. 
So they did that daily. Met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Each day, somebody put in the comments, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This really shows you a discipline of the life of believers. They came together in communal practices in the temple. So they met together. They weren't just in isolation. They weren't just watching online and not going to the church. And it's okay to watch online sometimes, but there ought to be a time that you get up and go into communal fellowship, fellowshipping with the community. This passage highlights that they had community and the community included fellowshipping and eating together, praising God together. They were sharing and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord added each day, daily to their fellowship, those who were being saved. So their lifestyle, their discipline, what they did daily, their lifestyle, it was joy, there was generosity, there was praise, it not only strengthened the community that came together, the believers, but it was so great that it attracted unbelievers and caused them to want to join the church. Hey, Elder Erica, listen, we need to get back to that. We need to get back to they worship together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. That means they weren't arguing, there wasn't strife, there was joy, there was something infectious and contagious about this early church that caused people to be drawn to them and the Lord added to the church daily. Now what they did caused the people to be drawn, but it was God who added to the church daily. I'm gonna say that again. Their fellowship, their community, their joy, all of that caused people to be drawn to them. But it was God who in turn added to the church daily. If you're just logging on, I'm talking about and underscoring the word daily. Second Corinthians 11 and 28. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And we might need to read a few more verses to get the context, uh, but I'm going to read it to you in the New Living and I'm going to uh, give you the context behind it. It says, then besides all this, I have the daily burden. It gives you the example. This is Paul talking. I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Hmm. Listen, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. I want you to listen to this. Paul was an apostle. Let's just give some basics here. He was an apostle, but Paul was a pastor. Somebody put in the comments, pastor. If you're an apostle, there is something that you do that shepherds the sheep. So Paul went around and planted churches and he didn't just go and open a church and leave the church. He opened the church and would shepherd the church, put a pastor in place. And then now as an apostle, he governed the churches or the pastors that he put in place at those churches. So you do not just call yourself an apostle. Really to be an apostle means there is a body of work you have done that that now gives you the merit of being an apostle. Hey, Brother Glaze. So all these people that have a prophecy over them that says they are an apostle, you, you that's fine. Uh, you know, starting a lot of businesses, all of those things can fall under the apostolic umbrella. But the apostle Paul was not just 
an apostle in name. He was an apostle in function. He would go out and he would plant churches and he would do the work to, to dig it out and to ensure its growth and to then put in godly leadership. And now, in for lack of a better word, now he can oversee the pastors that are overseeing the people. He has done the work. He does not write letters to churches that he does not have a relationship with. What gives him the authority to write a letter to any church to correct them, to exhort them, to speak blessings over them is because he has already done work in that church that gives him the authority to correct from afar, to exhort, to encourage, or whatever is needed. It was not a title only. It was a function. And so for those of that are coming on, we've talked about the word daily and some things that we are to give to God daily and going according to scriptures, things that we saw that were done daily back in the Old Testament, they were to daily offer up sacrifices. Uh, the Bible then says that God is going to daily load you up with benefits. That does apply to pastors today with several churches. Uh, but, oh God, you're going to make me get into something. Let me say this. Brother Glaze, I don't know if you'll have my back, if you'll just pray for me here. Let me say this how I see it. Hey, Michelle, um, let me, not how I see it, how I hear it. I'm not, Jesus. I'm, let me just get an example from the Bible. Paul didn't just say, I'm an apostle. Now bring all your churches under me and I'm gonna govern you. That's what I see happen a lot today. There is no really relationship, it's transactional. Paul had relationship because he spent time in Corinth. He had relationship, he spent time in Ephesus. He had relationship, he spent time in Philippians, in Philippi. So when he tells Philip, the Philippians that my God is going to supply all your need according to your riches and glory, he is telling them that because they were his largest donors. That was what we would call them. They were the church that supported him financially more than any other church. And because of their commitment to him in giving and financial support, not just prayer, now to those who have given back to him, he says, and my God shall supply all your need according to your riches and glory. So we have to take these scriptures in context. So when we talk about Paul being an apostle, he was not just walking around gathering people, he was doing a work. And the churches that he worked out, because building a church is work, working with people is work, loving people is work, leading people is work. He done the work which caught, made him eligible to be an apostle. So daily in 2 Corinthians 11 and 28, he says in the New Living, I want you to get what a being an apostle is about. That's why I had to stop and pause. He says, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. So the apostle has a responsibility. There is a burden. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All the way back to the book of Habakkuk. When Habakkuk, that when we, another scripture that we take out of context, we act like we can just write the vision, make it plain, and anything we write is going to come to pass. No, God was not talking about a vision board. This was Habakkuk going before the Lord. And the Bible says, the burden of the Lord I did see. So there was a burden that came from God to Habakkuk for God. God's people. And in Habakkuk having a burden from the Lord, the burden came from the Lord. It wasn't just because he was from this group and these people were like him. The burden came from the Lord. When you go back and read, because the burden came from the Lord, then he goes before the Lord in prayer and he is interceding. This is a prophet. He is interceding because one of the primary thing the prophet should do daily, because that's our word of the day. If I was teaching a class, his word is daily, is to intercede and pray for the people. So I don't really want a prophet that always wants to give me a word when that prophet has not spent time praying for me or praying for the body. The more you pray, 
the more you will hear God and the more you'll recognize God's voice. This is what I'm talking to you about now. The more you pray and the more you recognize his voice, the more you won't need a prophetic word either. So Paul says, so Habakkuk received a burden from the Lord. He was the prophet. Now in 2 Corinthians, here is Paul, the apostle saying that I am have the daily burden of concern for all the churches. So the words God gives him, the letters that he pens are birthed out of a daily burden that he has for all the churches. His responsibility did not leave when he could not see them. The responsibility was something he carried on the inside of him. The weight of it, the burden of it, the responsibility of it. He didn't have to see them physically to be concerned. He said, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. That's 2 Corinthians 11 and 28. I'm going to go back and read this one again. This is something that the scripture tells us to do daily. And because I have more people on here, I want to really read this one again. And I'm going to read it to you. In the King James, and then I'm going to read it in another translation. Hebrews 3 and 13 says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. So he's saying, I need to exhort you today. Lest any of you be heartened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now let's work this out again. I talked about this a little earlier, but I really want to give you this to you again. In the New Living Translation, hey, Miss Phyllis, praying for you, praying for your family. Love you much. I'm so sorry for your loss. I talked about grief at the beginning, Miss Phyllis. You may want to go back at the beginning, the first 20 minutes or so, and listen at your own leisure. This will be on my YouTube and on my Facebook, which is Christy Dobbins. Um, the New Living Translation of Hebrews 3 and 13 says, this is the exhorting. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. I'm going to read it again. Uh, I'm sorry, Crown. I, I love you. I'm sorry. You must warn each other every day while it is still today. So that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Now I'm gonna read it to you what it says. This 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 uses the word today because that means there's a sense of urgency uh, that is attached to this warning, so that somebody else will not just continue to be hardened in their sin and really become desensitized. That's really what's going to happen. So when you see the person sinning, but this is also a person that you're in relationship with, a person that you are able, this is why you're supposed to be in community. So many people want to live in isolation and I'm using the word community because it's popular, but really this is why you need to be in a church so that you have accountability. Discipleship is not discipleship without accountability. I can't just pour into you and give you the word and pray for you and do all these things and make sure you learn the foundation of the faith and make sure that you learn all of these things if I cannot also hold you accountable for that which you have learned. So when he's saying exhort one another or warn each other every day, while it is still today, when I see you in error, it is better that I warn you today so that you do not continue in the same sin and become desensitized to the Holy Spirit. And therefore you will grieve him or no longer even be in tune. And the enemy, the King James says, or even this translation says, you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Hallelujah. No, discipleship is not discipleship without accountability. Let me say this about discipleship. We will never outgrow discipleship. We need to put that in the comment. 
You will never outgrow discipleship. This is a faith walk. This is a walking by faith. This is going from faith to faith and glory to glory. You will never outgrow discipleship because when you grow and get to one level, now you have to start all over again. You will always need accountability. You will always need the body of Christ. That's why the enemy wants you to live in isolation. He wants you to live outside the parameters of accountability. He wants you to live within the parameters of your own mind your own thoughts. And you sit there and you say, well, God said to me, and God said this, and I get sick and tired of hearing so many people say God said, but yet there is no fruit that God said what he said. I don't know if you heard that. I didn't even mean to say sick and tired, but I hear so many people saying God said, Yet there is no fruit. There is no power behind the words. There is no anointing behind what you said God said. You said God said, then if God said it, when God speaks, it comes to pass. Because when last I checked, when God said, let there be light, there was light. The last I checked, when God told the heavens and the earth to divide, they, they were divided. God said it. So the last I checked, when God says it, it's not empty words. So I want you to really be careful. I'm going to go back and read a couple of scriptures because a couple of people came on late. And I want to underscore this because I want to go back to what the Bereans did. Hold on. And trophy of God, I see that you're in the nursing home. And I want to tell you that the Bible says that if anyone, there is anyone sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. And you call for the elder on today when you got in this live, on this live. And so I speak the word of God over you. I plead the blood of Jesus over you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. I pray that God would heal you. Healing is the children's bread. That's what the Bible says. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise you up. I touch and agree for complete healing in your body, healing in your emotions, healing in your mind. I decree that you are healed by his stripes. You are healed. He sent his word and it healed you. I plead the blood over that nursing home. I plead the blood over that atmosphere. I plead the blood over everyone that comes in that room and comes in contact with you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. We bind the spirit of infirmity and we lose healing and health over you now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God is not a respecter of person. If he healed the woman with the issue of blood, he will heal you. If he healed, and he did, healed blind Bartimaeus, he will heal you. If he healed the woman who was bowed over for 18 years, and he did, he will heal you. Hallelujah. In the name of that is greater than every other name. And right now you have a company of believers. We're like they were in the book of Acts. We're all in one place with one accord. We're touching and agreeing. We're believing that you will receive that which you have prayed for. We're believing for your body to receive strength. We're believing for the blood of Jesus to touch you now. We're believing in the name of Jesus for not just reconciliation in your body, but restoration all the way back to God's original intent. Be healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. Oh, you're only 41. You will live and not die to declare the glorious works of the Lord. Say them the blood of Jesus is against you and the Lord rebuke thee. Father, I pray now, I ask for ministering angels to minister to her, God. I ask God that you would intercept the plan of the enemy and overthrow and throw every plan, every word curse that's been spoken against her, every evil device that the enemy has tried to send to lure her out of your care, out of your hands, out of the body of Christ, out of the, uh, out of the body. The enemy is trying to turn you away from God. The enemy wants you to believe that you are by yourself. The enemy wants you to believe that you deserve this and you brought this on yourself. But I hear the Lord say, an enemy has done this. The Bible says, let me say something to you. The Bible says, no longer will the fathers eat great sour grapes and the children's teeth be set on edge. Meaning no longer will the children pay for the sins of the father. 
I decree that the iniquities of your father all the way back to the fourth generation, that they are annihilated and destroyed by the name and authority of Jesus the Christ. Rise up and walk. By your stripes, by his stripes, you are healed. Whatever that door that was open in your bloodline, whatever that door, that crack that was open in your bloodline, whatever that was, in the name of Jesus, we send the word. We send the word, and when we send the word, we're sending Jesus. We are sending Jehovah Rapha. We are sending your deliverer. We are sending the one who has already healed you. Now you have to do is receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Every lying spirit cease and desist from talking to her. Every deceiving spirit that is trying to convince her and talk her out of the will of God, we decree that you are healed. I did not even know you were in a test in a wheelchair, but I heard rise up and walk. I didn't even know it when I said it that you're in a wheelchair. But I pray that you receive strength in your ankles and strength in your legs and strength in your back and strength in your spine and strength from the top all the way to the bottom. Blood circulation flow in the name of Jesus. Blood flow, blood flowing now in the name of Jesus. No blood clots in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He's worthy to be praised. I don't know. Somebody needs to take a moment to praise him. In the name of Jesus, he is worthy to be praised. You're going to have to praise him in the wheelchair. You're going to have to praise him in the nursing home. You're going to have to open up your mouth and you're going to have to give him your ashes and receive his beauty. You're going to have to open up your mouth and begin to praise the name of the Lord. The healing and the victory is in your mouth. Be healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Psalms 145 and 2, because we're talking about praising right now, but we're still talking about daily. For those that came on late, I'm talking about things that we are to do daily, but there are some things that God does daily. And even Jesus prayed, give us this day our daily bread. See, sometimes we look at that prayer and we call it the Lord's prayer and we act like there's no power behind that prayer. But listen, if you pray every day, give me this day my daily bread. What's my daily bread today? Today, it might be the door that you open. Today, it might be that you are are giving me a new witty invention. Give me this day. What's today's daily bread? Psalms 145 and 2 says, every day, somebody said every day, this is what we all should do daily. Every day will I bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Every day, Every day you are to bless the Lord. Every day you are to open up your mouth and praise the Lord daily, 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 daily. You're to take up your cross daily. You're to take up your cross daily. Hallelujah. Same God. He's the same God. You're going to take up your cross daily. Luke 9 and 23. And he said unto them, if any man will come after me. So when you decide to follow Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying. If you're going to come after me, which means to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So the rules to following Jesus is to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. 
Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Elder Dobbins didn't say it. It's not legalism. This is what the enemy, the enemy is trying to confuse us with what's legalism and what is required of us daily. Hey, Angela, the enemy is trying to confuse us. It doesn't take all that. It takes all that because the Bible said it. The Bible says all disobedience is sin. So Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, Luke 9 and 23, then you have to first deny yourself Take up your cross daily and follow me. Every day, part of me, I have to deny. Every day, I take up my cross, which is sacrifice. Every day to follow Jesus. We sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. But if you are not taking up your cross, if you're not denying yourself and taking up your cross, you have not decided to follow Jesus. Hey, Elsa. If you have not decided. Let's let's put this in another translation so we can read it in the New Living Translation. This is Jesus talking. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, this is what denying yourself is. You must give up your own way. That's your own ideas, your own way of doing things, your own, anything that's your own, you must give up your own way. That's why I believe it's Isaiah 55 that says, his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. So what we have to do, I told y'all earlier, everything is an exchange. I need to exchange my thoughts for his thoughts. How do I do that? I do it with the word of God. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 to renew our mind. The only way to exchange my thoughts for his thoughts is to do it through the word. The only way to do it through the word is to know the word. So we saw Jesus demonstrate this for us when he was on the way to the cross. And he says, if it be your will, translation, if there's any other way to do this, let this cup pass for me. And then he says, nevertheless, not my will, translation, not my way, thy will be done. So to follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Hey, Eric. So to be a follower, so let's, I want y'all to get this. You're not really a follower, which is a disciple, which requires discipline, until you give up your way and take up your cross and follow me. So it means a daily commitment to setting aside your own desires, your own interests, your own plans, your own thoughts, and choosing his. To take up my cross, they're very similar, but it's really the cross was a place of sacrifice. So I got to sacrifice my will, my way, my desires. I got to give it up. And I got to do this daily. So we keep wanting the, the fire. We want to see miracles and we want to see signs and we want to see wonders. And we want to see them. Yet we talk to Jesus, talk to God once a week, twice a month. Uh, we want to see them, and yet we, you know, got a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of ratchet, whatever that means, because that in, that's not in the Bible. So when you say that, I want you to know that's not in the Bible. And death and life is in the power of your tongue, Proverbs 18 and 21. And I believe it's Proverbs 4 and 2 that says, thou art snared, which means trapped by the words of your mouth. So I'm not a little bit of God and a little bit of that. No, no, no. I'm not going to put those parameters around me and set a trap for myself with my mouth. 
I am trying to crucify that part of me daily. Crucifixion of me looks different. Someday it means being quiet when I want to speak. And the Holy Spirit is saying, be quiet. Some days it's being humble and trusting God rather than standing up and fighting my own battle. Because my flesh wants to defend me. But if I give up my way, oh God, then that means I also give up my weapons. I, y'all, I got that in real time. When I give up my way, that means I give up my weapons. That means even when I feel like I need to defend myself, I don't defend myself in my way because my way has a methodology or weapons that I use, but I'm gonna give up my way, so I'm not gonna use my weapons. I'm gonna use his weapons. Because his weapons are spiritual. They're not carnal. They're mighty. They pull down strongholds. I'm not gonna use my way. But but the way to be able to, to effectively do that is every day, daily, I take up my cross daily. And every time I take up my cross daily, it will be easier for me to make the right decisions in real time because this has now become a discipline and you will be able to trust your disciplines over your emotional decisions. You will be, I'm going to say it again, you will be able to trust your disciplines that is daily over your emotional decisions. So this is what we're going to do daily. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Just as Jesus prayed. Give us this day our daily bread. Some of you have not prayed that. And you are going to see the more that you pray that prayer, the more that God is going to consistently do what he said back in Numbers when he was talking, no, no, Exodus, when he was talking to Moses about the children of Israel and he was talking about manna. And let me let me just go over here right quick to Exodus chapter 16. I want to read you a few more scriptures than what I, what I read earlier. Exodus chapter 16. No, 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 no. I don't want that. No. Let me let me pull it up over here. I guess I'll read it in the New Living. That's what came up first. So I want you to hear because Exodus chapter 16 is a type of shadow of what Jesus prayed when he says, give us this day our daily bread. Exodus 16, they're in the wilderness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come up out of Egypt. So they are now in transition. They have left Egypt. They have been in bondage where they have been fed by slave masters. And now they are in the desert. The whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites, let me read this in the New Living. I don't know. I just prefer it. That's me. I, it's just me. It's just me. It's just me. I read normally King James and New Living. When the whole community of Israel set out from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of sin between Elam and Mount Sinai, they arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. It said there too, because they'd done this in the past. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around, pots filled with meat. So now they're sitting here really wanting to go back to slavery because they had food in, sla in slavery. But now you have brought us into the wilderness to starve us all to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, somebody say the Lord said to Moses. See, I said this to you all earlier. If the Lord says something, it ought to produce fruit. Whatever God says, it comes to pass. Then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day, somebody say each day. That means daily. The people can go out and pick up as much food as they need 
for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they follow my instructions. So God says, Moses, okay, I'm going to send down food daily, every day, each day. But they can get as much food only as they need for today. I am testing them to see if they obey my instructions. On the sixth day, they will gather food. And when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, by evening, you will realize it was the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaints. I want y'all to catch this, which are against him, not us. So when you are complaining, they were complaining about Moses and Aaron, and they were complaining about them. But now they're saying to the people, you were not complaining against us. You were complaining about God. Listen, people of God, there has been so much talk about church hurt and about the church is not this, and the church needs to do this, and the church is not this. You are not complaining about the church. You are complaining about God. I'm going to throw my shoe. I'm going to throw my shoe in it. You won't even be able to see it. You keep talking about the people and you don't realize you're talking about God. Because he has heard your complaints, which are against him, not against us. What have we done that you should have complained about us? Then Moses added, the Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning, for he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? This is what they said. And then Moses says, yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, announce this to the entire community of Israel, present yourself before the Lord. He has heard your complaining. And it wasn't even a prayer. It was a complaint. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness. There they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in a cloud. He's a good father because even in the midst of complaining, his glory showed up in a cloud. Hey, Tony. Hey, Pauline. I don't know if you caught that. His glory showed up in a cloud. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the Israelites complaints. Now tell them in the evening, you will have meat to eat. And in the morning, you will have all the bread you want. Then you will know I am the Lord, your God. That evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning, the area around the camp was set wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground, means it was covered the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. The King James says manna, but it's translated to mean, what is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, it is the food that the Lord has given you to eat. These are the instructions of the Lord. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some gathered only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them did not listen and kept some of it until morning. Now, he already told them, God is testing you to see if you're going to obey my instructions. But by then, it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its need. So after it saw the maggots, then they decided to obey the instructions. And as the sun became hot, the flakes that they had picked up melted and disappeared. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual. 
four quarts for each person instead of two. Then they, all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. So now they got to pick every day on the sixth day, but God said, I don't want them working on the seventh day. That's the Sabbath. It's holy unto me. So I gave you twice on the sixth day. You're to cook it and save the leftovers for tomorrow. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses commanded. And in the morning, the leftover was wholesome and good without maggots or odor. And Moses said, eat this food. Somebody say this today for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Some of the people went out on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, how long? So now I told you don't come out on the seventh day and you came. How long will these people refuse to obey my commandments and instruction? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. This is why he gives you a two-day supply on the seventh day. So there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not, not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. The Israelites called the food manna. It was white like coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord commanded. Fill a two-quart container with manna to preserve it for your descendants. Then later, generations will be able to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I set you free from Egypt. Get a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna, then put it in a sacred place before the Lord to preserve it for future generations. Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He eventually placed it in the Ark of the Covenant. So in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a pot of manna in the Ark of the Covenant. In front of the stone tables inscribed with the terms of the covenant. That's the Ten Commandments. So the people of Israel ate manna. I want y'all to hear this. Hey, Crystal. Hey, Elder Chris. And hey, Minister Sharon. The people of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they arrived at the land where they were settled. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. The container used to measure the manna was an omer, which was one-tenth of an ephah. It held about two quarts. quarts. I read you all this whole chapter of God feeding the children of Israel for 40 years daily. For those of you who are coming on, the word to, of tonight was daily. And the things that God is asking us to do daily and the things that he wants to do for us daily. He fed them daily manna. And in Matthew chapter six, when Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, he says, give us this day our daily bread. I'm going to challenge you to begin to pray that every day. Not out of religion, but out of expectation. God is no respect of person. If he did it for the children of Israel, Lord, give me this day, my daily bread. See, today your daily bread may be healing in your body. Uh, tomorrow, daily bread may be provision. The next day, daily bread. But whatever it is, give us this day our daily bread. I'm going to try to do a recap. And for those who did come on, I really, really highly suggest you go to YouTube or, or, or Facebook and listen to this whole live. 
Exodus 16 and 4 is when God tells them he's going to rain down bread from heaven. Numbers 28 and 3 talks about them daily working around the Ark of the Covenant. And they're told to give. No, 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 I'm sorry. Numbers 28 and 3 is daily offering up sacrifices. And thou shalt say unto them, this is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord. Two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day, that's every day for a continual burnt offering. So there should be a daily offering. I want you to see how these parallel. He said, give us this day our daily bread. And now back in, in Exodus, God fed them daily manna from heaven. In the book of Numbers 28 and three, he is telling them to offer up a daily sacrifice. And over here in the New Testament, he tells us in Luke 9 and 23, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Your daily sacrifice. These are parallels daily. Hebrews 3 and 13 tells us to exhort one another daily. What is called today. So he is saying while the day is still today, exhort one another daily. Well, when you read it in the New Living Translation, it means to give someone a warning about sin daily, lest your heart will be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Because if you don't warn them on this today, if you let it go to the next day, then you are you are now enabling them for their heart to have hardness against God. Acts 17 and 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, referring to the Bereans. And that they received the word with all readiness of mind. These are the Bereans who are receiving the scripture. They are eager. They are hungry. They're wanting to receive the word. But this is something that they did that everybody else doesn't do. They searched the scriptures daily. Somebody put in the comments daily, whether those things were so. So they did not just hear them preach the word to them. They went to the scripture every day. I want to challenge you that every sermon that you hear, that you go and search the scripture and search it daily to see if it be true. Every prophetic word. I want you to open up your Bible and see if that prophetic word lines up with the word of God. You need to search the scriptures daily. Luke 11 and 3 is much like Matthew 6 and 11. It says, give us day by day our daily bread. Psalm 68 and 19 says, bless be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. So there are benefits that God is loading us up with daily. He is loading us up daily. Blessed be the name of the Lord who loadeth us daily. So it's not just what I'm going to give to God daily. God wants to daily give something to you. Proverbs 8 and 34, blesses the man that heareth me. This is God watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors, watching daily at my gates. So you're going to watch daily at my gates. I want to quote this scripture right. Ah, I'm on the road, watching daily at my gates. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about those gates. I don't want to get off from talking about daily, but I want to talk about gates briefly, just briefly. It's a familiar passage of scripture. Psalms 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So when he's telling you, Watch daily at his gates. The way to enter his gates is through praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Acts 2 and 47. Oh, this one could really just send me over. And they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We talked about this in detail earlier. I'm just giving a wrap up of the scriptures right now, but I want to read this one to you in the New Living Translation as well. That's Acts 2, 46 through 47. They worship together at the temple each day. 
met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. <clears throat> Excuse me, daily, daily. Second Corinthians 11 and 28, I talked about this in detail earlier. This is the Apostle Paul who says that the burdens for the churches come on him daily. I talked about the true meaning of an apostle earlier. Let me read that one to you again. I'm going to read it in the, in the King James, and then I'm going to read it in the New Living. 2 Corinthians 11 and 28 says, Beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation so we get a full understanding. I'm waiting on the computer. And it says, Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. He's a true apostle. He has a burden for the churches daily. And I want to talk about that burden briefly because the Bible says my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when the Lord gives you a burden, much like he gave to Habakkuk in the book of Habakkuk, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Psalms 145 and 2, every day, daily, will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Hallelujah. Daily. It says, if you're going to follow me, Luke 9 and 23, deny yourself, take up your cross daily. That's your assignment is to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him daily. This sounds like it doesn't go with it, but something about this dropped in my spirit. Isaiah 10 and 27, very powerful Very, very um, familiar text. I'm going to read it in the King James, but then I'm going to read it to you in one other translation, and I, we're going to close on this. King James, Isaiah 10 and 27 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder, and his yoke from off thy ne neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Check. So you hear us always say the anointing destroys the yoke. And that's true. But I want to give you a deeper revelation on this. And I'm getting ready to, I want you to get this revelation because this is what's getting ready to happen. This is why the enemy does not want you to have a daily discipline of prayer, a daily discipline of studying out the scripture, a daily dis discipline of exhorting others and warning them against sin, a daily discipline of receiving his benefits, a daily discipline of going before his courts and his gates and standing at the gate and praising him, a daily discipline of prayer. The enemy does doesn't want you to have all of that because he understands that the anointing destroys the yoke. But I want to give this to you in another, another translation. One other translation. Because this is what he will know that will happen. Uh, I need it in a new generation. I need it in a new, new living translation. Sorry. One second. Sorry, y'all. Because I want to. I want you to get it. And I want to make sure I give it to you. That's it. It's the NIV, actually, this time. 
The NIV says it this way. In that day, and I'm going to tell you what your day is. Your day is when you begin to develop a daily discipline of prayer, a daily discipline of of reading the word, a daily discipline of praise, a daily discipline of receiving and allowing him to, to load you up with his benefits, a daily discipline of, say, of saying, give me this day, my daily bread. The enemy knows if he can disrupt the disciplines, that he can delay your progress. Oh, that's good. If he can disrupt your disciplines, he can delay your progress. This is spiritual progress I'm talking about. But Isaiah 10 and 27 in the New Living, in the NIV says it this way. The King James says, the anointing destroys the yoke. And it's true. But sometimes when we say it that way, we mean that the spirit is going to destroy the yoke. And that's true. The spirit can. But I want to read it to you this way. In that day, their burden will be lifted from your shoulders. Their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. I don't know if you caught that. Listen, I'm going to read it again. In that day, their burden will be lifted from your shoulders. Their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. What this means is when they were talking about a yoke, a yoke that will be put around the neck of the oxen, what the yoke the anointing destroying the yoke means, and what it means when it says, because you have grown so fat, it means that the oxen grew and grew, and he grew so much that the yoke had, that was once around his neck broke because he grew so fat. The enemy knows with your daily disciplines that you are going to grow. You're going to grow in wisdom. You're going to grow in love. You're going to grow in joy. You're going to grow in peace. You're going to grow in, in power. You're going to grow in authority. You're going to grow so fat that the thing that was once around you, the thing that once kept you constricted, the thing that once kept you bound will have no choice but to break because you have increased you have increased in, in, in love, increased in power, increased in anointing, and it breaks the yoke. And while you have been waiting for the spirit, thank you, Holy Ghost, to come down and break the yoke, the spirit is going to come up out of you and break the yoke. Every restriction, every place of bondage, every hindrance, you're going to grow so fat in the spirit. That it's going to break the yoke. And that's why the enemy fights you in that one word, daily. Because daily is connected to your discipline. And your discipline is connected to your growth. Oh, God. Your discipline is connected to your growth. The more disciplined you are in the things of God, the more you will grow and you will grow to the point that the yoke cannot contain you. Hallelujah. 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 We say change chain breakers. We yoke destroyers. We yoke breakers. It has to break. It has to break because you're growing in grace. Second Peter three and eight. It has to break because you're growing in because you've been denying yourself and been taking up your cross. Then now you resist the devil. You submit to God. You resist the devil, and he has to flee. It has to break. Give no place to the devil. This is why the enemy fights us on our daily disciplines. Because he knows what you do daily will either help you destroy the works of the enemy or will keep you warring against the enemy. It's time to break the yokes. And we're going to do it by what we do daily. Hallelujah. 
Second Peter 3 and 18, Diana. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. I'm going to get off so I don't stay on here all night. I'm already an hour and 38, and I was trying to be an hour. But listen, I'm looking for testimonies this week. I'm looking for te testimonies this week. I'm looking for you to grow. Listen, I'm going to tell you again, you're never, you never complete discipleship. We're going from faith to faith and glory to glory. And discipleship is not discipleship without accountability. I will. I thought about that, Jill. I thought about it. I thought about it. Hallelujah. Praise the God, Lord, for your son getting accepted in Georgia State. Listen, I'm going to get off. Yes, daily writing, daily worship, daily reading the word, daily studying out the scripture, daily going before the Lord. And don't forget to say, give us this day. Give me this day. My daily bread. Thank you, Alexandra. Listen, y'all, I, I teach Friday night, and I don't even know if I had confirmed this with my husband, but I speak Friday night if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, babe, cut it out. Um, that's Pastor Davis on the Eye and Firehouse, talking about daily kissing your husband. I speak for Good Friday, but it's an early service. It's from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. So it's a Good Friday service this coming Friday. I will try to post the flyer whenever they're supposed to send me a flyer so in my story so that you can see the location. If you are in the area and you need a Good Friday service to attend, um, Closing the Gap is April the 6th. Hey, Jolly, y'all still laughing at him. It's April the 6th. And um, if you are in the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, <coughs> go ahead and testify, Brother Lawrence. Praise the Lord. He said he's been dealing with panic attacks all week, made a last decision to come to the conference this week, ILS. Bishop Jakes preached the word today that broke it off him. Amen. Because he preached a word today. He did. I'm going to get off. Um, closing the gap is the six. If you're in the area, be in the room, St. Anne Episcopal Church. Um, Closing the gap in May will be on a Friday night, but I want you all to start preparing. For those of you, some of you who are out of town, I want you to make preparation. We are preparing something big for our eight year anniversary, if you will, our birthday. Uh, thank you, Brother Glaze. Thank you, Brother Glaze. Hey, Bianca. If you are in the, I, I, I want everybody to come on, make plans to be here this, June 22nd. And so uh, we're working on some things. And so I want to just put it out there. We may actually have a Friday night service and a Saturday service uh, to celebrate eight years. So we are working on it. We should have something solidified within the next week or two. So we will let you know, well, next week, within the next week, um, so that we can offer it and let people know by the beginning of April uh, how to make their arrangements. And so we're excited. We're excited about a lot of things. Okay, Jolly, she said, I'm coming in capital letters. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't have anything else. I'm going to let the Lord do what you do. Oh, I can hear people outside. Um, so I'm going to get off tonight. It, um, may the Lord bless you real good. It's an old song, but I just normally speak it. May the Lord bless you real good. I spent a lot of time. Praying that he would. May the Lord bless you real good. Yes, Erica, we will let you all know. Hey, Nakiva, I have not forgotten your baby girl or your text message, uh, but I am getting ready to get off. Yes, it'll be in Dallas in June. Uh, Jill got faith. I'm not going to sing it tonight. It's an old song, though. I don't even know. 
if people would know it, the Lord bless you real good. Spend a lot of time praying that it would. May the Lord bless you real good. But love y'all. And er Elder Erica told me she saw you. This Friday is going to be, I'm going to get the address for you, but it is at Cedar Crest, but it's behind every door at our Cedar Crest location. So we have a chapel at that location. For those of you who don't know, I'm on the board for Behind Every Door. It is a faith-based nonprofit organization. We have a new facility. It's amazing. And it, it's a, it have a chapel. And so we're excited about what God is going to do. And it's from 5 to 7 p.m. That's why it's not going to be like all night, like, you know, how churchy I am. Um, but I will get the address and everything posted uh, soon. They're supposed to send me a flyer. So hopefully I have that by Monday and I will, I will post it and get it to you all. Love you all with the love of the Lord. Um, thank you all for staying on with me so long tonight. And I will see you tomorrow night on Sunday night check-in. Love y'all. Have a good night.